Hello ladies and gentlemen, it is me Matsmus. I appreciate you being here on today's video. We are discussing military fitness today, specifically the Canadian Armed Forces. Now as many of you are probably aware, I am a reservist soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces as a artillery gunner in the Canadian Army and I'm very proud soldier to say the least. Um, I must admit, transitioning from the British Army as a veteran from the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers into a Canadian military environment is a big step from, you know, the usual of what I've used to with the British Army. One big thing is snowy, cold environments, and uh, the one thing I noticed initially when first started to train here in the snowy environments was how actually difficult it is to just to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we're not going to talk about winter warfare specifically today, it's more along the cases of it is a lot harder to operate as a fitness standard in snowy cold conditions than I have ever expected it to be. Just trying to soldier in snow is three times as hard due to the level of effort you have to put in when walking along snow, traveling with equipment, moving equipment by foot, etc, etc. And it's, it's hard work. And what I want to talk a little bit about today is the Canadian Army standards of fitness and the kind of tests you may be put across to actually get within the armed forces and to stay within it. Now, I want to make something very clear before I go further with this video. I'm obligated to tell you that the information I'm going to give you in this video is not of that of a subject matter expert. What that means is I am not a fitness training instructor. I'm also not uh, in a position to say that you will follow the exact principles and steps that you will see in this video. This is merely a guideline and an overview of some things you may expect to see going into the Canadian Armed Forces as a fitness test fitness standard or fitness level that you may be put across. Now you're more than welcome to ask me questions in the comments section about anything related to this video but once again I'm only going to be able to give you information that I know of and it is not to be taken as uh, you know 100% accurate because things change. This video could be around for quite some time, standards change, uh, processes change, the way the tests are administered change, so please make sure that you do not relate or refer to this as something that you're going to say, oh, I'm not going to pass that, I can't get in, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. You need to speak to your recruiter, you need to go see the recruitment depot and make sure that you speak to them and have the concerns and questions you may have with the fitness test to an actual professional who is designated in administering the exams or administrating the tests so that you can actually get all the facts. So I want to make that clear. So going into the video itself then, I myself have got to admit that uh, I've always loved um, being tested tested and assessed on my level of fitness in the army because it really gives you a benchmark to start from. It says, you know what, I am pretty out of shape right now. I need to figure my life out, get back into the run of things and be prepared to, at some point, especially if you're serving, be operationally ready. And that's the key. We want to be able to be deployed. If you're joining the armed forces and you don't expect to be deployed, you may be having to have a couple of questions with your decisions because primarily that's what we're there to do. We're there to complete a mission, a job, a task. If you're not physically fit enough to do so, you're going to have a pretty hard time. Now, the Canadian Armed Forces has done a lot of hard work in producing programs that are actually very relatable and that you can actually define as different levels of where you're at. And I love that. Now, in the British Army, we had the similar kind of thing. Uh, we had a thing called the 300 Club, which was really cool. Basically, when you um, completed the fitness test, if you got over a certain score, I think it was 300 points out of all the testing that you did, the mile and a half run, the push-ups, the sit-ups, etc., you would be given a t-shirt as a kind of incentive and rewards program. And interestingly enough, the Canadian Forces has the same thing. Now, what I want you to primarily take away from this video is really just an insight as to the kind of things you're going to be participating in when you do Canadian Army um, or Canadian Armed Forces fitness tests, because... I always wanted to have a bit of an insight before I joined, and I know a lot of people were asking me questions once I did join um, who were following in behind me like, hey Matt, what was the fitness test like? Was it hard? Was it difficult? And what you're about to see is actual demonstrated footage of exactly what the test is um, administered like, what the kind of things you're going to be doing, step-by-step -step process. So we'll talk about it a little bit further on after the videos themselves, but I'm going to let them run through so you can have a nice broad overview of exactly some of the things that you may be expected to do in your fitness test. And remember folks that this may change at any time.
At the core of the Soldier First Principle, there is one job. To find out more, contact your local PSPT. So there you have it, guys. As you can see, um, these tests are more stringent upon the technique that you have to use to be able to perform these exercises. Now, we will go over the actual force test specifically in a second, but what I want to focus on here primarily is not how challenging things are and how difficult they are, because that's all anyone ever thinks about when they think about fitness testers. How hard is it? You've got to realize that the test isn't there to, to make you fail. It doesn't want to catch you out. They want to ensure that the level of standard of fitness is functional to allow you to do your job. If you can't meet that standard, then unfortunately you're not able to do that job. And that's why it's imperative that you work heavily on your fitness at all times. I'll safely say as a reservist, I do not expose myself to nearly as much uh, fitness as I really should do, as opposed to what the regular force is on a mandated schedule where they have to basically attend PT sessions at, at many times. As a reservist, we don't have that uh, opportunity as much, and therefore it's the onus is on me to do my own fitness. And I've got to admit, I've got to do more of it, and I think we could all say the safe bet that we should all do extra fitness, even if you're at the highest level of fitness you could be, we could always do more. And these tests really do focus more upon the lines of, okay, so you've hit that standard, but what's your next step? What's the next point that you could get to that will improve your fitness and that can show that you can do more and do better for next time? You know, passing the bare minimum standard should never be anyone's basic principle or core focus because you want to succeed to the highest level and the highest standards because you want to be at the highest level of operational fitness that you can be. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, that's your primary focus to be operationally ready to be able to perform your job at the highest professional level doing what you've been trained to do. If you can't do these tests, then clearly you're going to have a bit of a hard time, as I mentioned earlier. So let's take a look specifically right now at the force test, which, uh, you know, I'm due probably in the next few months to actually participate in and get back into the uh, the training year. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. I need to definitely work on uh, getting my results up. The last score that I got on my particular fitness test was gold. Uh, I'm aiming for platinum, and we'll talk about the scoring system in a little bit further here. But first of all, let's take a look at the force tests and uh, the kind of standard of testing that you're going to see when applying for the Canadian Armed Forces at the bare minimum basic level of fitness. The purpose of the 20 meter rushes is to assess the participants' ability to move quickly over short distances while changing body positions. The objective is to complete the course within 51 seconds. To start, the participant lies prone on the floor, shoulders and hands behind the 20 meter start line, facing the opposite end. Hands are raised from the floor. On the command go, the participant gets up and sprints to the 10 meter line. At least one foot must touch on or over the line before getting down into the prone position, with shoulders and hands on or behind the line. Both hands are then raised off the floor for a hand release. The participant then gets up and sprints another 10 meters to the 20 meter line. At least one foot touches on or over the line before getting down to the prone position with shoulders and hands on or behind the line. A hand release is performed. The participant then gets up, turns around and sprints back to the center 10 meter line. This sequence is continued every 10 meters until 4 times 20 meter lengths have been covered and 7 hand releases have been completed. Any time there is a fault, the participant must correct the fault immediately before continuing. Common faults include failing to touch on or over a line, failing to assume the prone position, shoulders and hands on or behind the line, failing to perform a hand release. Time stops once the participant's foot is on or crosses over the line. The purpose of the sandbag lift is to assess participants' physical capability with military materials handling tasks. The objective is to complete 30 sandbag lifts within 3 minutes 30 seconds. Before starting, the sandbags are positioned across each vertical line. The participant stands straight facing the wall, each foot on either side of the floor line. On the command go, the participant squats down, lifts the first sandbag with two hands, and touches it to the wall. The participant then releases the sandbag and travels sideways to position themselves in front of the second sandbag, feet on either side of the floor line. 
The second sandbag is lifted, touched to the wall, and released before traveling sideways again back to the first sandbag. This pattern is repeated for a total of 30 lifts. The sandbag must touch the vertical line, ensuring the midline of the sandbag is at or above the one meter horizontal line. If the sandbag is not horizontal at the time of wall contact, the bottom of the sandbag must touch at or above the one meter horizontal line. At the moment the sandbag touches the wall, there must be two hand contact with the sandbag. The sandbags must be grasped by the ends, avoiding the straps and eyelets. For any incorrect lifts performed, the lift will not be counted. Examples of incorrect lifts include failing to touch the sandbag to the vertical line, failing to ensure the midline of the sandbag touches the wall at or above the one meter horizontal line, throwing the sandbag at the wall, failing to land each foot on either side of the floor line, and grasping the straps or eyelets to lift the sandbag. Time stops once the 30th sandbag has touched the wall. Time to completion is recorded to the nearest second. The purpose of the intermittent loaded shuttle is to assess participants' ability to repeatedly carry loads. The objective is to complete five sets of alternating loaded and unloaded shuttles within 5 minutes 21 seconds. Before starting, the sandbag is positioned behind the start line. The participant stands straight behind the sandbag facing the 20 meter course. On the command go, the participant picks up the sandbag and performs one loaded shuttle around the 20 meter cone and back. At least one foot must touch on or over the start line before the participant drops the sandbag behind the line. The next shuttle around the cone and back is performed unloaded. This pattern continues for a total of five sets of loaded and unloaded shuttles. Walking briskly while carrying the sandbag is permitted. Running is permitted during the unloaded shuttles only. The definition of walking is that one foot remains in contact with the floor at all times. If a participant runs during a loaded shuttle, they will be directed to stop by the evaluator. Forward movement must stop completely before the participant continues. The sandbag may be carried using any safe technique, including use of the straps or tie. The sandbag may be set down at any point to rest. However, timing of the evaluation will continue during any rest periods. Any time there is a fault called by the evaluator, the participant must correct the fault immediately before continuing. Timing of the evaluation will continue during any corrections required. Common faults include running during the loaded phase, failing to travel around the 20 meter cone, and failing to touch the line before dropping the sandbag. Time stops once the participant's foot is on or crosses over the line at the end of the final set. The purpose of the sandbag drag is to assess the participant's ability to drag a load. The objective is to drag sandbags over a distance of 20 meters without stopping. The carry sandbag is attached to the dragging sandbags by a strap. The carry sandbag is positioned toward the 20 meter course with the first row of dragging sandbags aligned with the starting line. To start, the participant faces the dragging sandbags, picks up the carry sandbag in a cradle carry, hands underneath. The strap on the carry sandbag is positioned downwards. The participant then walks backward with the carry sandbag until the strap between the carry sandbag and the dragging sandbags is taut. On the command go, the test may begin. The participant drags the sandbags 20 meters without stopping until the first row of dragging sandbags have touched the 20 meter line and clear has been called by the evaluator. Only the carry sandbag in the arms may be used to pull the load. Use of the carry sandbag handle or strap is not permitted. 
The test is discontinued if the participant stops movement during the drag or the evaluator becomes concerned for the participant's safety. Please note, dragging surface will influence the amount of weight required to be dragged. So the force test then, I want to start off by saying do not look at the test as something that is going to be too difficult to do or you think, oh, I'm never going to be able to complete that, I'm not going to hit that standard. Relax everyone, relax. Okay, you need to realize that this is something that you have to work up to if you're not used to this kind of training, of uh, this kind of assessment. You need to get some practice in. You're more than welcome to, you know, ask me questions on tips or advice as to how to increase your fitness. Um, as I mentioned before, my current standard on this test is gold. Looking to go platinum. That's not me bragging, but it is giving you a little bit of an insight to say, yes, I am able to complete this test in a fashion that can give you at least some tips and advice into completing it. So the shuttle test is pretty much one of the easiest portions of the entire test, I would say, for the fact that it is basically just running to a line, getting down, getting back up again, and running back to a line. The technique is crucial here in terms of following the rules. A lot of people fail this test for not listening to the instructions that you've been given. Listen to where you are supposed to stop. Do not get ahead of the instructor in terms of where they tell you to go because you will be told to do it again and it will not count. Make sure you stay behind the line. Make sure you're touching the line when you're told to. Listen to your instructor when they're doing the test. If you don't, you're just making life more difficult for yourself. It's really, really important you do that technique because if you're not doing it right, they'll just tell you to go back and do it right again and you're wasting crucial time and effort for the rest of the test. Remember though that, uh, you know, people make mistakes and if you don't get the test done correctly the first time, then you'll always have another opportunity. This isn't a one-all, fail-all, you'll never get in kind of thing. You'll have the opportunity to try again, but please folks, if you're going to apply, make sure you read and learn about the test before you go into it from online sources, or take a look at another sort of couple portions of this uh, video and have a bit of a review uh, because it's it's great getting your fitness really high but if your technique and following the rules isn't there well, you're kind of just setting yourself up for failure now the sandbag portion of this test is actually fairly simplistic it's not too difficult just again make sure you're following the rules make sure you're lifting that bag correctly bending with the knees keeping your back straight and placing the bag over the line if you don't place it over the line it will not be counted and once again you're wasting vital energy for the rest of the test. This is sometimes a bit of a make or break for some people because they're not prepared with their upper body and their, you know, thigh muscle strength. You need to be able to lift these weights multiple times in quick succession in the time limit. Trust me when I say this, you have plenty of time to do this at a fairly natural uh, and steady pace. It is not burning yourself out trying to get these things done as quickly as humanly possible. If you want to get a good score, then of sure, you know, go for it, push out. But if you are just new to this kind of training and this kind of uh, testing, take your time, listen to your instructor. They're going to give you cues. They're going to give you times to remind you of where you're at. As you can see by this lady here, she is doing a great job of just kind of taking her time, shuffling safely, bending correctly, placing the bag where it needs to be, and continue on. And I can almost guarantee at this pace, she will pass the test with absolutely no problems. This is where you can really burn yourself out for the rest of the test. So I urge you that if you're going to, you know, go all out on this portion, make sure you have enough energy in your tank for the rest of the test. Because if you go all out crazy, and think yeah I got a wicked score and somehow you either you know jolt a muscle or you're just completely burnt out you maybe kind of overestimated or underestimate the situation you may set yourself up for a bit of a hard time for the rest of the test so make sure that if you're gonna do the exercise you do it correctly with the correct method and that you don't burn yourself out for the rest of the test because you've got a little ways to go yet but don't be nervous of it don't be shy of it practice you're more than welcome to you know grab some weights in the gym and start practicing and you know squats squatting is definitely a big part of this exercise and getting a good grip on that bag you know making sure that you're actually able to lift it comfortably with your hands your wrists your, your arms your forearms because they're fairly heavy and uh, the technique is pretty important in this because you could really hurt your back um, if you don't do it correctly now the intermittent loaded shuttle is starting to get a little bit more tiring now this is to test you to make sure that you can carry heavy equipment long distances or fairly long distances and continue on the fight now again this is where people can start to get a little bit more burnt out because they go way too hard too fast um, especially from coming off from the sandbags that you've just done against the wall because this is all being done in succession. Now normally you're allowed to take a small water break in between each exercise but you're not given too much time to recover so again do not overdo it. Don't push too hard because you may potentially cause some issues. However 
If you're feeling comfortable, you want to get a good score, go for it. All for it. Push as hard as you possibly can. Get that good score. Make yourself, you know, known that your fitness is good. And that's a good thing to have. Having some, you know, um, I guess some core respect for yourself to say, you know what? This is a fairly simplistic test. I think I can push it a little harder. Why not? Go for it. Do some sprinting in there. You know, this gentleman's uh, running and jogging correctly lifting, correctly moving. This is the perfect way of passing the test. But if you really want to excel and push a little further, that's as a soldier or any kind of military member you want to try and do and, and inspire yourself to do, then do it. Push that a little harder, but don't overdo it to the point that you're going to struggle on the rest of the test because you will give yourself a really hard time. Also, don't cheat on the test. As you can see, this gentleman was running at the beginning. That is not what you've been told to do. Make sure you're walking with the sandbag. You can walk very quickly if you wish to, but make sure you do it correctly. Listen to your instructor because, again, you will make a really difficult time for yourself if you're not listening to what they're telling you to do because you will either fail or they'll make you redo it and you're reducing the time on which you have to complete the test and pass it. Follow the instructions, guys. I know I keep saying it, but this is the number one thing I want you to take away from the force test is listen to what you're told and do what you're asked so that you don't make more work for yourselves or potentially fail the test in general. Now, again, this is all about pacing yourself. You really need to concentrate on, am I going a little too hard here, a little too fast? Do I have enough energy in my tank for the rest of the test? Practice for this is really just as simple as it seems. Uh, you know, working on your upper body, working on your cardiovascular training, and making sure you get some fitness standards up ready to go for the test. Now, the sandbag drag is my favorite part of the entire test because it's the home stretch. <laughs> it's the last piece you need to do for you to pass. And uh, a lot of people are terrified of it because they pick up a couple of sandbags and they see all of them combined with the weight on top of it. They're like, oh my goodness, no way I'm going to be able to pull that. However, do not be scared of it. I can assure you that it is not as difficult as you think it is. Your own body weight and the traction that you're going to be using walking backwards actually gives you a lot of capacity and capability to pull these weights. Now, the people do sometimes struggle with the momentum of doing this particular exercise. The key to this is once you start, keep going. Do not slow down. Do not try and give up because you will fail. If you go to a halt, you are done. You will have to redo it. That means the entire portion. And that is not what you want to do. So keep the momentum. Focus on what you're doing. Use that upper body strength along with the body weight and that traction of you walking backwards with your heels. Dig those heels in and pull those bags. I can guarantee you it's not as hard as it looks. Once again, listen to your instructors. Do what they ask of you. Don't be cheating by pulling on those tabs because, again, they're going to get you in a bit of trouble and you're going to have to redo it. Don't rush. You have as much time as you want to complete this portion of the exercise. However, don't stop either and give up because, again, it's just going to be a really bad day. Use the momentum. Keep yourself going. Do not be overwhelmed by the weight. I have seen many people who've seen those bags and seen people do the test thinking they're going to fail it, and they absolutely annihilate it with no problems at all. People whose upper body isn't as strong, people who aren't as fit as they think they are, and they still do very well. Is it a struggle for them? Of course, yeah, that's not what they're used to, and they, you know, need to work on that upper body, but they still pass. So don't be, you know, intimidated by it. For most people, it's actually a fairly simplistic um, pull, but for some people, they're not used to that, and it's not their kind of body type to be lifting or pulling such weights like that. Sometimes the first time you've come across having to do these kind of techniques, then yeah, maybe a challenge, but don't feel, uh, you know, it's a daunting task. I can guarantee you, with a little bit of training and a little bit of guidance, you'll be just fine. So just as a little tidbit on the end here, I want to showcase the combat side or the combat fitness test, which is more sort of specific to wearing your tack vest, your helmet, and carrying a rifle doing this kind of fitness test too. And I find it really interesting. I haven't actually performed this fitness test yet. I would really like to, and I'm probably going to ask my unit if I have the ability to attempt this test. But take a look at it and see what you think. Start with bag on the left. Two hand grasp, up, up the line and down. Shuffle over, just like the force test on unweighted. What the force combat is, is it's a physical evaluation to replace the uh, load bearing march, which was the previous uh, individual battle task standard uh, that the Army was uh, incorporated into the training. All right, so the first part of the test, you'll go out and do your five uh, kilometer load bearing march. All right, you have in between 50 minutes and 60 minutes to complete the test. You need to come in after that 50 minute time and obviously before the 60 minute time. Once you're done the test, you'll come in. I'll have uh, Sergeant Wiseman take your score. At that time, an assessor will come grab each of you and say, okay, you have five minutes. 
At that time, you can take your helmet off, have a quick drink of water, take your load, uh, sorry, your small pack off at that time, and then once the five minutes is up, we'll carry on into part two of the test. The guys and gals will be going out and doing a five kilometer march with 25 kgs fighting order, an additional 10 in the small pack. Then they'll return back here, have a break, and then they'll start the force evaluation, keeping the 25 kg fighting order on. Three, two, one, up, go. Something like 80, 90% of any type of combat mission takes place in an urban environment, which requires different demands on the body. So it requires more of an anaerobic type metabolism as opposed to a long aerobic type activity. So we developed a generic urban operation simulation and we measured the physiological demands. And from that, we modified force with the load that you would wear in fighting order that accurately reflects the physiological demand of doing and performing an urban operation. We didn't make up any equipment. We didn't add on any weight. We gave them the basic loads of what you're stepping off the helicopter with or what you're stepping out of the APC with, the armored personnel carriers. The equipment we wear during this evaluation is what we'd be using at all times anyways. So nothing's made up. So this, as far as I'm concerned, is probably one of the best evaluations to test your minimum standard of physical fitness in the last 30 years. For the force combat, there's no different standards based on age or gender. It's required to be taken by any Canadian Armed Forces personnel posted to a land duty allowance a unit, instructors in the Canadian Army schools, and anyone in a level three or below headquarters. La partie la plus difficile de l'examen que j'ai trouvé, c'est la levée des 30 sacs. Ça demande une bonne position pour le dos. Durant l'examen, je conseillerais de prendre des grandes respirations, prendre le temps. Je conseille que tout le monde ait la chance d'effectuer une pratique pour se mettre en confiance avec les différentes étapes, puis savoir quelles sont les prochaines étapes. My advice would be to not be afraid of it. If you plan and you train and you prepare yourself for this test and you work on your upper body strength, there is no, you will have no concern. Just pace yourself and put yourself in the right mindset that uh, the test is achievable and you'll have no trouble. Soldiers that uh, complete the force combat, they will still have to complete the force evaluation on an annual basis, which will um, have them meet universality of service for the Canadian Armed Forces. Fitness is the backbone of the, what we do in the military, and especially the Army. Uh, and this is a general baseline of where you should be at all times. So this force evaluation is a great way to determine which level of fitness you're at. So you can either increase your fitness or just maintain your fitness to be operationally ready. So a little bit different this time, we're actually carrying fighting order, or we call FFO, full fighting order, with the rifle, uh, completing the force test with a loaded carry. And that, to me, is very, very interesting because uh, I've never completed it with Canadian Forces in this setup before, in this style, and I would love to give it a go. And I, as I mentioned, I'm probably going to talk to my staff, see if I can get a chance to actually try this out. Um, it is uh, a little bit more challenging at this level, though, folks. As you can see, we are carrying equipment that is uh, a little bit more heavy on the body, and doing the march is uh, going to add to that difficulty. But again, this is what real soldiering is about. This is what we do. This is what we carry. This is what we need to do with our jobs. And this is the stuff and equipment that we're going to be doing when we're completing these kind of tasks. Once again, I want to make it clear. And as a couple of individuals said in this particular video is do not be afraid of it. If you're prepared and you, you know, set yourself up for success, you're going to pass no problems at all. Now, this particular test, as I said, I have never had it actually administered to me before. That's not saying it won't be administered or you're not going to be, you know, exposed to it. But this is more of a tidbit to give you a little bit of an idea of other kinds of capabilities that can be given to you in terms of testing. Finally, I want to give you a quick showcase as to the kind of things that you can look forward to in terms of the standards themselves for the kind of scoring that you're going to get when you do these kind of tests. As I said, I am trying to get platinum in my next fitness test. I can almost guarantee you I'm probably not going to get it because I've not done as much training as I should have to get that standard. Uh, the last test I did to get gold was on my DP1 training and my fitness is pretty high. But uh, let's take a look at this video. It gives you a good overview of exactly the kind of things you can look forward to uh, in terms of the levels of uh, assessment that you're going to get. Physical fitness is imperative to your job. That's why each year you take the force evaluation to determine your level of operational fitness as outlined within the universality of service. 
The force evaluation tells you whether you're physically fit to do standard military tasks, but it doesn't give you an accurate picture of your overall physical fitness. That's why we've introduced the Force Fitness Profile to give you a valuable, accurate tool to maximize your overall physical fitness. There are no career implications related to your profile. Your score on the Force Evaluation remains the only physical employment standard for serving in the Canadian Armed Forces. So, how does the Force Fitness Profile work? After you complete your Force Evaluation at your best effort, as quickly and safely as possible, without compromising technique, your times on each of the four test components will be converted to a point scale, which takes into account age and gender. The second score in the profile represents your health-related physical fitness. This score comes from a combination of your force evaluation results, as well as a measurement of your waist circumference. These two elements will give you a sense of your overall fitness, which ranges from amber, operationally fit but physically unfit, to yellow, operationally fit and marginally physically fit, to green, both operationally and physically fit. Your score will tell you where your fitness ranks in comparison with other military members of the same age and gender. You'll receive an immediate post-evaluation debrief on your results from a PSP fitness professional who will provide a tailored fitness prescription and direct you to services, tools, and resources that can help you take your fitness to the next level. If you perform better than average on your force fitness profile, you may achieve the bronze, silver, gold, or platinum levels. These exceptional scores will qualify you for the incentive program. There will be individual and group rewards to recognize excellent results. To find out more about the Force Fitness Profile, contact your local PSP team or visit cfmws.com slash force program. So there you have it folks, a bit of a rundown as the kind of things you can expect for the assessments um, criteria in general. I hope you enjoyed today's video and got a little bit of an insight as to some of the things you may see coming up in your aspiration to be a part of the Canadian Armed Forces. If you have any questions or concerns, please make sure you approach me in the comment section below. If you want to be notified of any upcoming videos from my channel, please hit the little bell button by the subscribe button to be notified. And once again, I just want to make it clear that this video is purely there for informative purposes and not to be used as a reference. Thank you again for everyone's attendance in today's video, and I will see you next time. All the best. Bye-bye.